Namaskaram uh, to all of you, Manoj, Eddie, uh, Kunal of course and everybody else uh, who is there in the conference. My namaskarams to all of you, please, Kunal. Yes, thank you Sadhguru. So the first question is, most of us have a understanding of the word conscious or unconscious. And for those of us who don't, we can look at a, do a dictionary and understand what that word means. But from a spiritual, from a spiritual point of view or from your point of view, or from your understanding or your experience, what does it mean to live a conscious life? Uh, what does it mean to live an unconscious life and at a personal level? And how does that translate into a worldview? <coughs> well, uh, well, Kunal, you've introduced me well, so I can go ahead without <laughs> any breaks on it <laughs> Well, <laughs> to put it simply, you cannot understand what is consciousness. Because understanding always comes from accumulated knowledge about something. Essentially, consciousness means an intelligence within you which is not shackled by your memory, an intelligence which is completely unsullied by your memory. There is a in dimension of intelligence within you which is untouched by memory. Everything else about you is memory, whether it is uh, you know, evolutionary memory, genetic memory, karmic memory, conscious and conscious subconscious memories, various types of memories. In yoga, we see eight different dimensions of memory. Everything that you are, the shape of your nose, the color of your skin, you, the way you sit, the way you stand, the way you speak, everything that you call as myself is uh, an amalgamation of a very complex dimensions of memory. But there is a dimension of intelligence within you which is not ruled by your memory. Why is this dimension so important? Because memory means survival. Memory means a boundary. What is within my memory is familiar to me. What is outside of my boundary is strange or in... Uh, well, you're in California, it's weird, all right? Anything that's not in your... <laughs> anything that's not in your memory is bound to be weird. So, what is in my memory is my friend, what is not in my memory, who is not in my memory is a stranger. This is the basis of your experience. So there is a dimension of intelligence within you, which is unsullied by memory. Only when you touch this dimension, do you know what it means by saying limitless or boundless in terms of experience? Because every other experience is encapsulated within the shackles of your memory. As useful as it is, the memory, it is also a prison. It is our survival, it is also a self-imprisonment. Self... Uh, survival of the self and self-imprisonment, both these things are done. Memory is a wall that you have created, within which there is a whole world of your own. But memory means in some way physiological and psychological process. Your physiological process may be run by the evolutionary memory and genetic memories. Your psychological process is run by a variety of other dimensions of memory. But essentially, memory means your physiology and your psychology. The, the biggest mistake that we have done right now in the world, especially the Western societies, the way they're looking at it is, we have misunderstood or mixed up rather, psychological realities and existential realities. So this is why always we are trying to understand something. The way we are talking about India right now, the way the Indian culture or the Bharat has looked at is, it is always about realization, not about understanding. So consciousness can be realized but never understood. Thank you for that. Um, on Along those lines, if, if we are shaped by our memory, if our consciousness is shaped by our memory... No, no, I would like to correct the question. To... Our consciousness is not yeah. shaped by memory. Our conscience may be shaped by memory because conscience is a social phenomenon. If our memory is our prison, what can we do to, to get out of jail? 
Uh, before we call it a prison, we must also understand, today the way you are, your memory is also your possibility. Everything that you're doing is from your memory. A whole lot of your memory may not be conscious memory, but see the English word conscious is used in many different ways, so there could be confusions about that. Uh, we are talking in terms of physiologically being con conscious or unconscious, psychologically being conscious or unconscious. Consciousness <clears throat> will keep the word consciousness little away for the sake of understanding. Being conscious and conscious is a different aspect. So, everything that you are, from the shape of your body, from the color of your skin, the way you understand life, the way you perceive life, everything is ruled by your memory. So, it is also your possibility. At the same time, it is a limitation. You will realize the limitation of your memory only when a longing to grow beyond these limitations arises within you. See, everybody, every human being has a longing to be something more than what they are right now. But that something more is a very incremental piece. So this is why we need to fast forward our life and see right now. Little desires that you have, when you were a eight-year-old boy, maybe your greatest desire was a bicycle or something like that. Then it went on expanding, expanding. So this desiring process is a longing to expand within a human being. This longing to expand, we are going in an incremental way by installments. Right now sit here, everything that you have desire for, let's say it's right now come true, what's next? You will desire something else, something else, something else. Just do all this right now in the next five minutes. Everything else that you could possibly desire till the end of your life. If all of it is done right now, what is next? Then you will see you still want to expand in an unknowing way. You still want to be something more than who you are. When this longing becomes a conscious process, then naturally you're seeking to break the limitations of what you know. This is why in yoga, the yogic culture always saw that knowledge is a limitation. We never identify with our knowledge. We always identified with our ignorance because what I know, it doesn't matter how much I know, what I know is a minuscule in this existence. If you compare what you know to the cosmic space, it is a, a, an absolute minuscule. But what you do not know, your ignorance is boundless. So we always identify with our ignorance. The entire culture has been built up upon it. This is something that has been seriously misunderstood by the rest of the world. Why India has been the way it's, it's been, though there is an immense amount of knowledge right from ancient times, why is it they refused to exploit knowledge because they saw that exploiting knowledge more and more, just using it to the extent that it is necessary for your life is different, but basing your life, life on the knowledge that you possess will ultimately trap you in a way that you cannot extricate yourself, that you start building, it's like a spider's web, you start building the web of your knowledge and you get trapped in it. Right now, see, whole lot of people are trapped on the internet, but we are making use of it, it's good <laughs> So what role does, does knowledge play? What role does intellect play in moving forward, in shaping a planet what, what role can those things that all of us use on a daily basis that we know, how can we use those things to our advantage and not be entrapped by them? Uh, uh, I don't know whether you use this consciously or not, but you use two words in this question which are very significant, intellect and knowledge. Because your intellect is absolutely useless if you do not have a bank of memory, which is knowledge. If you do not have any memory, if I wipe out all your memory, you will find your intellect is useless. So today we have this experience, like uh, today you buy a new computer, maybe the best in the world, but it still does
fantastic. I am not saying it's not fantastic, it has brought many, many possibilities into our lives. Knowledge is useful as a survival tool. Intellect is useful as a survival tool. When we say survival, maybe if we were uh, whatever number of years ago, we were cavemen. You are beginning to look like one, I have always been one, all right <laughs> No, no, the, the beard grows naturally on a man, but somehow it's become weird these days <laughs> because <laughs> If <laughs> someday it may so happen, nose will be weird, be, uh, weird and everybody will remove their nose because, uh, you know, today the virus is there, mask is not weird anymore, mask is normal, all right? It's a new normal. So, what is our… <laughs> today, wherever you are, <laughs> mask is normal. <laughs> you don't have to be a bank robber for that. <laughs> so, this intellect cannot function without knowledge. That means, what can it do? It can recycle the data that you already have in various permutations and combinations, but it cannot come up with anything new because its root in, is in its knowledge. So, uh, you know, today the virus is there, mask is not weird anymore, mask is normal, yeah. all right? It's a new normal. Yeah. Uh, so, depends, what depends is our... where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Today, wherever you are, <laughs> mask is normal. <laughs> you don't have to be a bank robber for that. <laughs> so, this intellect cannot function without knowledge. That means, what can it do? It can recycle the data that you already have in various permutations and combinations, but it cannot come up with anything new because its root in, is in its knowledge. So, what is the use of knowledge? Knowledge could enhance our physiological and psychological existence. But how much will you enhance it, I'm asking? Physiologically, if your uh, food is taken care of, your health is taken care of, its basic needs are taken care of of the body, it's a done thing, there is nothing more you can do. But today you see a weird world trying to do all kinds of things to stretch physical experiences. Why there is such a overflow of alcohol, drugs, sexuality is simply because people are trying to stretch the physiological boundary. You must understand the essence of physicality in the world is a defined boundary. Without a defined boundary, there is no physical nature. Now you're trying to breach, in your longing to expand, you're trying to breach the physical boundaries of your existence. Well, it's a wrong way to do. This is why they're telling me 30% of the people are obese on the planet because they're trying to stretch their physical boundaries, either absolutely physically or in terms of experiences. A whole world is moving in this direction. Somehow, they want to stretch their experiential dimension. Right now, because their whole experience is limited to physiological and psychological experiences, they're trying to stretch that. You think you're stretching it, all you're doing is memory. You cannot do anything else with these two dimensions. So, when you realize the limits of your physiological and psychological existence, that is when you will seek something beyond, which right now the English word is uh, not really competent to describe, but the word consciousness means a dimension beyond this. In the yogic culture, we call this chitta. An intelligence beyond, in, beyond memory is called chitta. So, how do we as… let me put it this way. Is it more important to take care of the planet consciously? Or is it more important first to take care of the inner journey consciously, or are they inseparable? See, when you talk about taking care, for taking care you need knowledge, because taking care is survival. Whether you take care of this body, take care of this mental well-being, take care of your family or your society or global societies, or all life on this planet, this is from knowledge. So, taking care essentially means survival, isn't it? So, don't link survival to consciousness. Being conscious that our life is 
uh, you know, enmeshed with every other life on this planet is knowledge. It is not consciousness, but this knowledge could have come out of consciousness, but unfortunately, this knowledge also we have acquired incrementally, you know, very piece by piece, piece by piece, through scientific knowledge, we pieced all this together and now we are talking about environmental science. But this is something that you could realize from your limitless sense of experience, because your experience transcended the limitations of your own genetic and evolutionary memory, and you know the way the world is made. In the sense, in yoga, we are always saying anda pindanda. What this means is, the way an atom is made, that's where the... that's the way the entire cosmos is made. So individual life, if you realize the nature of this life, in... in a... in a... in a certain way, you have realized the nature of the whole cosmos. This is the basis of yogic science, that if you know the very essential nature of what this is, you know in reflection what everything else is. So, how do we have to take care of this planet consciously? Definitely, we have to... Con we have to take care of this body consciously, we have to take care of the planet also consciously, because your body is just a piece of this planet. If the planet is not healthy, your body is not going to be healthy, is a simple realization, but we have gone around two hundred years of science to come to this and still you are not able to convince everybody on the planet, all right? Because there is no such inner experience, there is no realization of what am I made of, so it is just going on. And to convince somebody that the health of the planet is directly related to your own health and your life, <laughs> just see how much it is taking. This is simply because you're trying to bring consciousness with bits and pieces of knowledge. Hmm. Speaking about unhealthiness, since we're on the topic, uh, given uh, COVID and given the times of disease, let's say this time is a time where we are obviously afraid of the disease, we are afraid of contracting the, the virus, we... the planet may be in one way healing, but humans in one way are suffering. So, the dichotomy between those two, can you speak about that and speak about the times and, and health during these times, both mental and physical? See, as you said, uh, the dichotomy between the two, which means, essentially, we've gone away from the life process. How life mm. happens upon this planet, we've moved away. Our... as I said earlier, we've mixed up our psychological and social existence with the existential realities of life. Existentially, our life is not separate from the life even of the virus, I'm saying, because <laughs> there are more microorganisms in this body than the number of human cells that we have, actually, many more. So, our life is not different from the life of the virus. But right now, here, the virus lives so vigorously, that in our body, it is becoming virulent in some sense. So, having said that, why have we moved away? Simply because we have taken our individual experience rather too seriously. We must understand that as you... as you sit here, you are breathing. That means you cannot exist without the atmosphere. To sit here of this size and shape, you have eaten plenty in your life, because it's just a soil which has become food, and food which is sitting here as you and me. And uh, the food that you eat, the water that you drink, the planet that you walk upon, the air that you breathe are not separate, it's all one existence. But it is the magnanimity of creation that for a tiny speck of a life like us, when I say a tiny speck, you know, people uh, think, what is he saying? Well, in the cosmic experience, if you look at the cosmic space, this solar system itself is a tiny, tiny speck. In that tiny speck of a solar system, planet Earth is a micro speck. In that micro speck, Los Angeles is a super micro speck. In that, you are a big man. This is a serious problem. <laughs> this is I... a problem, human being. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> you said it's okay. I'm. You're used to abuse, you told me so. <laughs> I'm used to your meanness, it's okay. I'm used to it. <laughs> I can handle so this it. <laughs> is the, this is the essential human problem. 
that they have taken their individual nature rather too seriously. We must understand for a speck of a life that we are, that we are given an individual experience is not that we something we earned. It is the magnanimity of creation that it's been given to us. But people are taking their individuality so strongly. Now they're thinking, why this virus, why this bacteria? Are you and me exist because of virus and bacteria. Why is it going wrong in my body? That's what we need to see. Why is it? It is not my friend. Why is it working against me? Why is it that I've brought something which is not my friend into my system? This is something we need to look at it. But uh, right now we are seeing how to kill all the virus on the planet. If we kill all the microbes on the planet, that's the end of life on this planet. I want to go back to something you said that is so beautiful, which is we are so, we take our individuality very seriously. And, but that's also because that's all we know. If you sit and you say to me, you can sit here and you can be the cosmos. I, through my experience of meditation and silence, may be able to experience that. But I feel people, it's very intimidating, I think almost scary for people to give up that individuality because maybe for years and years and generations, that's all we've known as our individuality. I think that it feels intimidating for someone to realize that they are actually part of the cosmos or that all is one or that they are one with all. I think that it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful experience, but I think what scares people is that either they'll say it's just a concept, it doesn't make sense. Or if I am to believe that, then how am I, what happens to me? And I think this is, I would love to hear for someone who is almost slightly scared to jump into the ocean of all of this, what you would say to someone like that. Where does that, where does that initial fear come from? Well, uh... See, we, we're kind of going back to this. I clearly said, you cannot approach limitless consciousness with limited knowledge. Again, mm. you're attempting that. Don't do that. Yeah. There is no need for every human being to think, how do I become cosmos and all this nonsense? Mm. It's not necessary. First of all, you said, if I, if I do believe that, you should not believe a damn thing. Mm. You understand? You do not believe anything or disbelieve anything, that is when you have identified with your ignorance. Identifying with your ignorance means you clearly understand what you know is a minuscule, what you do not know is a boundless possibility. So if you have mm. identified with what you do not know, in a constant mode of seeking, if you are in mm. a constant mode of seeking or the basic qualification to be a seeker is you have life not. Unfortunately, without knowing anything, you will have confidence. So people have chosen confidence against clarity in their life. Biggest mistake. Everybody wants to believe something. Because, you know, I want you to just imagine, let's say, say right now you're fitting the role in case you get a role like this on the television that you have to play a caveman. You're, you're kind of growing there. You need to grow a little more, but you're yeah. getting there, all right? So, suppose you were a caveman, without protection, you're just living outside. Most people don't know what this means. Only those who have been in the wild, who camped outside, but today camping is also like a, like a luxury hotel, okay? If you just <laughs> been there without any equipment in the jungles, which I have spent weeks and weeks at one time, well, if it just rains, monsoon rain, people think all you need is an umbrella and run to your home. But you just stay in a tropical forest when the monsoon rain is pouring. With lightning, thunder, everything going and all creatures trying to find their own little shelter, the little shelter that you have found belongs to somebody else. <laughs> and that guy will take it aggressively, <laughs> all right? The whole experience of this planet and the way life is happening on this planet, if you just feel it, you will know what I'm saying. If you were up in ages ago without any protection, without any equipment, without even a watch, because that's how I was when I was in the jungles. I didn't even know what time it is, and I'm not even able to look at the stars or the moon or anything 
because it's cloudy and it's pouring rain, you don't know how long you've been soaked. You don't know when daylight will come. You slowly start having doubts, will it come at all? Is there a guarantee? Because there's no guarantee about that either. So essentially, if you are there, then you, you felt so threatened, your existence. You felt how small you are and how your existence is threatened every moment. People are thinking their existence is threatened only because of this virus. No, your existence is threatened every moment, all right? If you are conscious of it, naturally, you would find... Uh, want to find something that builds confidence in you. So you decided to believe in something. Mm. Initially, there's a thought, sun came up in the morning after being soaked in the rain for twelve hours. Then you said, sun must be God. Like mm. this, it grew. And then we made more human forms of gods and whatever. So you started believing in God, which gave you confidence, which did not give you clarity. Confidence without clarity is a disastrous process. And this disastrous process we have taken on for the last 2000, 2000 that continuously we've been building. This disaster has cost how many lives you can calculate in the last 2000 years. It's taken too many lives. This is the significance of India, that this was not a culture of belief. This was a culture of seekers. This is why you found them, though they were hugely empowered, massive kingdoms, enormous wealth, but they were always like this, bowing down to everything, because there was no confidence. No confidence, we did not see it as a negative process. No confidence we saw as a possibility that you will naturally work towards clarity. The more clarity that arises in you, then you won't need confidence. See, right now you're walking during daytime, where you can see everything clearly. You don't need confidence to walk. But suddenly, let's say it's pitch dark and a new terrain. Well, now you need confidence, because there is no clarity. So you're using confidence as an alternative for clarity. This is a disaster, because when you have no clarity, one most important thing is, at least you must have hesitation. Right now, for example, you mentioned the uh, virus right now. See, we've been driving our economic engine in a certain way. Engine has been roaring, every human being, every one of us, without exception, have been pushing the throttle as much as we can. But do you know who has the steering wheel? When the engine roars, the most important thing is, somebody has a steady hand on the steering wheel. This is very important, when the engine roars. Engine has been roaring. Do you know who is holding the steering wheel? Is anybody at all has a hand on the steering wheel? So, you've been driving fast, but it is like, you know, like a... These are people who are on... Uh, because you are from Los Angeles, I'm telling you, it is well before your time. In 60s and 70s, people took LSDs and jumped off the uh, tall buildings thinking they're going to fly. And they did fly for some time. That's the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're looking at me. I don't take LSD. You're looking at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say um, anything. No, no, no. My parents are watching. Please. Um, I wanted to. Um, I wanted to. You know, part of this whole thing is also India Global Week, and you touched. You touched upon um, how Indians are seekers, and that has been a big part of our cultural uh, culture. But what is it that India has done for the world, and how do you see us? What role do you see us playing moving forward? In the in the in the global spectrum of uh, of everything, how do we move forward? Uh, how has India helped the world move forward? So, what is India's contribution to the world? If that is a thing, there are a thousand things to say, but because both of us are on right now uh, in United States, let me count some. Uh, I mean, uh, quote somebody because I'm not used to quoting anybody. Usually, I'm not good at those things. But let me quote Will Durant, uh, you know, an American writer who wrote about the story of human civilization or something like this. India was the motherland of our race and 
Sanskrit, the mother of Europe's languages, India was the mother of our philosophy, of much of our mathematics, of the ideals embodied in Christianity, of self-governance and democracy. In many ways, Mother India is the mother of us all. I think he encapsulates almost everything that I would have liked to say, because it will go into thousands of things that have been contributed and which have been misrepresented around the world. I think... Uh, I know uh, there are a whole lot of people who will immediately pounce on me for this, but I think uh, a more unprejudiced look at world's history is very needed. Then you will see a whole lot of threads will go back to India. When I say thread, we were the first ones to weave the thread also, the cotton and silk thread. Mm. And the sutras, mm -hmm. the yoga sutras, karma sutras, shiva sutras, brahma sutras, and even kama sutra, all right? Yeah. <laughs> we talk about uh, Be the Revival, that is a big theme uh, for this week. Are we in a revival? Is a revival of utmost importance? Are we at any point of time always in a revival? Or is this a, a certain point of time where that is absolutely necessary or already uh, a train that is in motion. See, what do you try to revive? You try to revive that which is dead, right? Mm. How do you revive the living, I'm asking? So, instead of talking about revival, let me put it this way. See, the greatest contribution, in my opinion, uh, Will Durant maybe did not cover this in some sense. In my way of looking at life, which is not intellectual. <laughs> you can see I'm not intellectual. <laughs> My way of looking at life, the most significant dimension that came from India is, many, many thousands of years ago, Adiyogi said that if you are willing to strive, you can evolve into whatever possibility that is beyond the natural limitations of life. What you think are laws of nature which are controlling you, you can go beyond that if you strive. That is essentially he is saying, you are not some kind of an absolute or some kind of a making of God that God made you perfect and you are there. He is talking about you can evolve, but it takes striving. Like we know today there is an evolutionary theory which, which is about 150 years old uh, that came from Charles Darwin. But many thousand years ago, over twelve, fifteen thousand years ago, Adi Yogi spoke about evolutionary process on the planet in a different context. And then he said, as a human being, you can evolve, but you can only evolve consciously. Because unconscious evolution of bringing you to this point of evolution is over. Now from here on, your evolution can only be conscious. But now, if you want to evolve consciously, one important thing, whatever you're calling as yoga, for example, because the entire Indian culture is fundamentally rooted in the yogic culture. When we say yogic culture, let us not think of just twisting and turning as it's happening in the world right now. When we say yoga, we're talking about union. When we say union, in your experience, your, your sense of your individual and the universal has merged. You have become one with the existence. From that context, Everything has to happen, that is what it means. First you establish in yoga, then you act. This is the thing that is going on in India, yoga stahakur karmani, always people are talking about it. Without knowing, they think if you twist and turn, you're in yoga. No, that is just a physiological to prepare the body so that it's in some sense of comfort and well-being. But the important thing is you have a sense of union. As we already went through, your barriers are only of memory. What is yours, what is not yours? What is you, what is not you? All this is rooted in the accumulated memory that you have. So to transcend this is yoga. To transcend the limitations of what you think is me right now is yoga. Now, we are trying to transcend this intellectually, but this whole yogic process essentially means you are absolute maker of your destiny. This is the only culture on the planet which gave you this idea that your life is your karma. That means your life is your doing. The karma, the word karma means act or action. 
So your life is entirely your, your making. So this is not... This is a godless culture, I want you to understand. People, Indians will have a little bit of a shock, but they need to go through this because they need to understand you have evolved in a culture which does not believe that you are an absolute stamp by somebody from up there. You are an evolving process. If you're willing to strive, you can go beyond all those so-called natural limitations upon yourself. Now, why is this important? This is important because Adi Yogi might have said it 15,000 years ago and might have given mechanisms and methods to evolve yourself beyond that, but the world was never really ready for it. Human beings were never really ready for it because they did not have the necessary intellect to understand, first of all, what he's talking. In the sense, today, 21st century, more people can think for themselves than ever before. Whether they're thinking right, wrong, that's a questionable thing, but more people are thinking for themselves than ever before. To put it uh, in a very, uh, you know, in a realistic way, see, hundred years ago, women were not even supposed to think. If they thought for Ooh. themselves, they were branded as witches and you know what happened to them. So, straight away, with education spreading without gender, uh, gender discriminations, 50% of the human population has come into the thinking process of their own own thinking. Once you start thinking, you naturally think logically. Once you think logically, anything that's illogical doesn't fit into your mind. Right now, we are in a cusp of a generation. We are struggling between these two, belief and seeking. The, your intellect wants to know it is seeking, but your memory is soaked in belief. So this is a generation which is right now struggling with this. So as quickly as because it is essential that we evolve consciously in this generation we must raise questions about the fundamentals of everything that we have believed till now right now when i say everything that we have believed this is something i'm seeing uh, which was <laughs> which is a kind of a retrograde in my experience i was just watching uh, uh, you know like you're in los angeles probably if i say football you will think of that that thing which doesn't look like a ball which they throw yeah, because yeah. our idea of football is round, so we call it football or soccer now. I was just looking at the history of this game. I saw when people like uh, Pele was playing, George Best was playing, Krayuf was playing. Whenever they st uh, struck a goal, uh, they just jumped around. They uh, they shook hands with each other, or you know, just leapt up or did a somersault. That was it. But now I'm seeing in recent times, whenever they score a goal, they will do, you know, God, you scored the goal. I thought only yeah. Maradona, only Maradona had that hand of God, but it looks like everybody has because <laughs> everybody is looking up and praising God. Even in India, when they, uh, when they score a century, they're saying, you scored the century. Yeah. Now, this, this is a backward step, I'm saying, because... Mm. This is important in this generation, we ask questions. Questions means like this, now you're pointing up. Is it true the planet is round? At least now you know. In India, we have always known the planet was round. You must understand mm. geography is referred to as Bhugol. That means the studying of the globe. This is not now. I'm talking about Mahabharata times when five, six thousand years ago, they talked about planet being round, not because of Galileo, well before that. So if you look up on a round planet which is spinning, inevitably you're lo looking up in the wrong direction, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if, when you're talking about intellect, this is what intellect should do. It take out everything that's illogical within you. If everything illogical is taken out within you, that means all belief systems are taken out within you, you will naturally come to a state that you clearly understand what you know is so small and what you do not know is limitless. This is what makes you a seeker. You don't become a seeker because I say you become a seeker. You become a seeker you because you clearly understand the limitations of your faculties, how far it can go. And you, when you see there is a wall that you cannot cross, then you understand you need to seek. And instruments of seeking are needed now. Now, 
till you see, let's say you are in a prison and the prison was very big and you thought you were free and you're walking all around. One day you hit the prison wall. Only when you hit the prison wall, just your two legs are no more enough, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You need something else to burrow through this wall or climb across this wall or fly, fly across this wall. You need a different methodology or a different faculty or a different process for this. This is what spiritual process means. Spiritual process is not looking up or looking down. The word spirituality has become one of the most corrupted words on the planet, but essentially spiritual means you hit the limitations of your physical and psychological structures. So now you're looking for something beyond. Now something beyond does not mean you score a goal and say this. You're saying that because you think somebody up there is doing it, that means you're a... Uh, you're a goal scorer by chance. <laughs> so if you live by chance, anxiety is normal. If you live accidentally, anxiety is normal, isn't it? So right now, that is what everybody is saying. Anxiety is normal, you have to treat yourself, you have to do this. No, anxiety is not normal. Anxiety has come to you because you have assumed things that you do not know. You have used confidence as a bridge, not your clarity. If there was clarity, there would be no anxiety because confidence is an empty shell. You're always anxious. But logic, I think that is the confusion. I think that's what we get mixed up. What we think is logical makes sense to us. Like if you say the earth is round, the only way it makes sense to me is if I see a photograph of it. This is my logic. This is what logic does to us. So... No, no, it's not your... Clearly it was like that. Then uh, we went up and stood on the moon and looked down. Absolutely clear, it is round. So you distance yourself from your reality. That is when you know this is what is needed for you to understand the limits of your physiological and psychological process. You need a little distance. This is what the tools, the many, many tools that yoga is providing is just this, to create this distance between you and what you have accumulated. When I say what you have accumulated, I'm not talking about your fancy 12 sets of golf kits, 12 uh, sets of golf clubs that you have and uh, clothes and... <laughs> I know, I know, it's okay. And many things that you possess, but the very body that you carry is an accumulation. The very mind that you carry is an accumulation. The very genetics that you carry is an accumulation. The very human form is an accumulation of things over a period of time. and the most important dimension of Bharat is this, to possess everything, but never to be possessed by anything. Yes, beautiful. Sadhguru, on that note, we don't have much time left. I will uh, invite a wonderful moderator back. Uh, I think she has some questions that were sent in, um, I believe. So she may be coming on to ask some of those questions. Uh, thank you for being nice to me today, not yelling at Eddie, me I will be, time. No, no, I will be very careful with Eddie because she's not used to my meanness, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to be very careful with my words. I can see that from your conversation so far. So, I have some questions that have come through from the audience. Here is one that's come through from Rohan from India. He's asking, what are some simple steps that humans should take in their daily lives towards a more conscious planet or towards becoming a seeker? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, is this question coming from United States? Because... From India. Oh, India is the new West, let me tell you this. <laughs> the urban India is... <laughs> the urban India is further west from Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> so, this takeaway culture, okay, you said all this, but what is the takeaway? Tell me three things that I can do. <laughs> no, there's only one thing that you have to do. No, three things, I'll make it much simpler for you. Only one thing that you have to do is continue your life. Today, if you don't have... Uh, if you're in the university, you want to pass this examination, passed. Then what? 
you need a job, got it. Then what? You need promotion, you got it. Then what? You want a million bucks, you got it. Then what? Then you want this car, that house, this wife, that kind, this, 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 very thing, everything. Got it, got it, got it, got it right now. Then what? Just look at this one thing, you will become a seeker. Mm. Very Interesting. Good. The only… the only problem is, you're approaching… you have a intellect that no other animal has, no other creature on this planet has. You're not making use of it to… The, the idea of such an intellect and such a vivid sense of memory right now that human beings have, no other creature has the complexity of memory that we have. So the… the fundamental nature of this is that you don't have to go through every experience of life. Sitting here with your… with your memory structure and your intellect, you can experience everything that human… human beings experience just by sitting here, even with eyes closed, you can experience all those things because all human experience happens within you. The range of possible experience that… experiences that can happen within you, you can go through by yourself. You don't have to spend a lifetime to experience little bit of food, little bit of sexuality, little bit of meditation, little bit of this, that, peacefulness, joyfulness, blissfulness, whatever. You can sit here and do all that in the next five minutes and be done with life. Does it mean you're done? No. That means the longing to expand beyond these limited things will naturally arise. That's when you become a seeker. So here's a question from London. This is coming from Shrey in London uh, and asking what worries you most about the state of the planet today? Uh, I'm not the worrying kind. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, one thing that we must see, the only choice that we have is this. The planet is not in any kind of peril. It's only human experience which would go through terrible things if we do don't take care of a few things. So if you're talk… using the word worry in such a way, yes, what worries most is just the top thirty-nine inches of soil on this planet. The average topsoil on the planet is thirty-nine inches. These thirty-nine inches of soil literally is responsible for over ninety percent of life on this planet, including us. These thirty-nine inches of soil, there has been a huge amount of degradation in the quality of that soil in terms of its organic content, in terms of the amount of life that should be happening within that. Mm the biodiversity has been dropping drastically in the last fifty to seventy years. So if we don't take care of this thirty-nine inches of the soil, and the only way we can take care of it is to put back substantial organic content into it. The only way we can put back the organic content is the green litter from the trees and the animal waste. Animals we are eating up in billions per year, and trees are largely gone. So this is the concern. If we don't put s substantial amount of world's soil under tree shade, if we don't do this, others will reduce in their numbers and they may bounce back the moment human beings are gone. See, this is something we need to understand. Uh, we kind of touched upon this uh, when I was talking to Kunal. For example, if uh, all the insects on this planet disappear, all life on this planet will end within four to six years' time. If all the worms disappear, in eighteen to twenty-four months, all the life will disappear on this planet, including you and me. If all the microbes and, you know, viruses and bacteria and everything disappear, life will end right now. But if all human beings disappear, planet will flourish. So we need to understand this that we are not the center of the universe. This is one of the most disastrous ideas that has entered human mind is that in terms of religions and philosophies, people started propagating that every other life here is here to serve human beings. Human being is a centerpiece. Human being is made in God's own image and he is the center and all life is supposed to serve him. 
you do one thing, you go to a colony of ants and ask them, do you want to serve human beings? They will come up your legs and they teach you a lesson, all right? <laughs> they will tell you that they have a complete life of their own. Every creature has a complete life of its own. They are not here to serve us, but their very nature of existence is serving our existence. We must be grateful and respectful and caring about them because we have a capability to create and destroy. Right now, we are largely exercising our capability to destroy, not exercising our ability to create. So, I think time is up. I might ask you one question of my own to finish, which is that there's a lot of discussion about this word resilience. Uh, and I wonder what you make of it. You referred to going out into the jungle and living through a monsoon. Uh, and I've spoken to other people, people who've had very tough times growing up, who have come through this current crisis actually in a, in a uh, perhaps a healthier mental state than some of us who didn't have those tougher times. So I wonder if there's any lesson there or anything that you would add to that. When I was in the no, jungle... I... Oh, so you're asking Sadhguru. Sorry, sorry, Sadhguru. I'm sorry, please. Yeah, you want to say something? I was say joking. I've never been in the jungle. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> No, you meant the Jungle Book, I understand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's, that's literally what it is, yeah. Literally movie, yeah. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> me going through the monsoons in uh, tropical forests were not tough times. They were the best times of my life. I never saw it as tough time, nor do I look back on it as tough time. I described it the way I described because most people don't have an experience of the planet. Their whole experience is always of 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Their air conditioners are set like that, and that's all they know on the four walls in which they're living. By doing this, both physiologically and psychologically, you're becoming fragile. So, one who is living on this planet, experiencing this planet, is not naturally far more resilient but I, I don't like to use that word resilient. He's no, he's lo a lot more natural, he's more life. This is why I said, unfortunately, most human beings are given to misunderstand their social and psychological setup as existential realities. Rain, sun, flood, river, ocean, this is all the world. Your ideas of what is this, what is that is all psychological. Every day it can change. It can... you can go through ten scapes of your psychological faces right now if you're willing, but most people are stuck to one scape. But if you're willing, ten different... what happened when you were twelve years of age? What was your idea of the world and what was most important to you? What happened when you were eighteen? What happened when you are thirty, forty, fifty, sixty? If you look at it, you took sixty years to get through this, but if you are willing, you have enough intelligence. I'm saying every human being, not any special human being. Every human being has the necessary intellectual infrastructure to go through all of it within five minutes. If he's willing, if he or she is willing, within five minutes you can go through the sixty years of experience and evolve quickly. This is what evolving consciously meant. So what you need is not resilience. Resi the word resilience gives you a feeling that you're holding on to something really hard. I'm not holding on to anything really hard. It is just that you... you have understood and you have experienced that your existence is not independent. It is in relation to everything else. See, the way we launched some of the major massive movements that we launched in India is simply like this. We launched what is called as uh, Rally for Reverse, one project Green Hands, now Conscious Planet. The basis how I brought this about in people's experience is this. I saw there was not enough green cover in the southern states where we were. So it was sixteen percent. I said our aspiration is thirty-three percent. How to get it there? So initially I tried to talk about, see, we need to plant trees. Nobody had any attention. Then I made them sit in hot sun at eleven o'clock in the morning. Uh, in southern India, you know, it'll get you. 
So then I moved them under the tree shade and everybody, ha, ah, like that. Then I told them just, I set up a, a certain process which is still going on. I said, just breathe and see what you exhale, the tree is inhaling. What the tree is exhaling, you are inhaling. There is a certain way to make it a living experience within you. Once they sat there and experienced this, they realized one half of their lung is hanging out there. <laughs> and they're planting trees and planting trees, you can't stop them now. <laughs> because they know it's their lungs. <laughs> Uh, that's a really beautiful place to stop. I wish we could continue, but Sadhguru uh, and Kunal Naira, it's been a, such a pleasure having you on the Be The Revival, the India Global Week. I've been Edie Lush, and I hope very much to come into contact with you guys again. Thank you. Namaskaram, Thank you. and uh, my best wishes for the, uh, the India Week that's happening. Manoj and others who are putting this together. The most important aspect of India is this an absolute experience of inclusiveness and an immer immense experience of life is what we call as Bharat or yoga. So this experience needs to happen to every human being. If you want to make human beings as supportive and productive as microorganisms are to life, <laughs> good time to look at it at the time of virus, you know. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Namaskar.